So the intention of this kind of thing for me is that we have basically physics and math. So this is part of my, this is not my motivation, it would be very broad. If string amplitudes is an example of something in, you know, it belongs to physics, how physical it is, you can debate, but it certainly belongs to physics. And we have automorphic forms over here, which certainly belongs to mathematics. <clears throat> the problem with these things is that they tend to be connected here at the summit. So you have to dig through a lot of work to get to this, and you have to dig through a lot of work to get to this before you can talk to each other. And so that creates a huge problem for somebody like me who tries to talk to you already now before you climb this mountain side. If I may push this analogy maybe too far, let's say that I'm providing you with a golf cart so you can have the senior tour where I just drive you to here and let you off here, and you can just enjoy this view from the summit, and then you can walk across from both sides. And now there are not many math students here, but I think you can think of a course like this that you should be able to talk to mathematicians. So even if you don't talk to them right now, I want to provide you with language that you can talk to mathematicians. And in particular, let me warn you for one thing. I work with mathematicians, as Steve also has. And there's one real danger, I think, that we have to be aware of. So let me be explicit. The danger is that we fall off this bridge because of essentially what I would call intellectual snobbery. So intellectual snobbery means I won't listen to you because you don't speak my language. So we're not going to fall off this bridge, right? Not fall off this bridge. Not complain that the other person is pedantic or the other person is sloppy and just try to understand what the other person is trying to say. So my motivation, I will complement these little lectures with videos. So you have already seen hopefully my video page. And in video zero, called why string theory, I gave my favorite 25 reasons why you should care about string theory. So just go and look at that and we can discuss it next time if, if you're interested. For now, I'll just assume that, that you're here for some reason and that you can find your motivation on your own. Let's start by just defining the most basic object in string theory in general is the embedding. The embedding is a map, capital X, let's say from the complex numbers, if you want, including infinity, if you want to be specific, to Rd, d-dimensional Euclidean space. By this, I mean that you take a coordinate z, and it's mapped to capital X, where you put coordinates. You coordinatize Rd by x mu. And mu is, runs from, in my conventions, as default, 0 through 9. So there are 10 of these coordinates in the default construction of string theory. And already here, I intentionally picked this because physicists think this looks pedantic. You have to say where are you mapping from, and it looks pedantic. But it's a common misunderstanding that mathematicians want everything to be rigorous. In my experience, good mathematicians are able to postpone rigor to their own papers. And when discussing with physicists, what they ask you is to define what you're doing. Physicists tend to confuse being rigorous, which is annoying to physicists, with defining things which we should all ask each other to do. We should always say what we're trying to do. The X that we use in string theory, which is this map, is not an embedding. Embedding in the mathematical sense, necessarily. For your convenience, I put a reading guide to Polchinski's textbook on my webpage, which means that I give short quiz questions on each chapter, which I provide answers to in a separate file. And they are just bring up this, uh, this slight subtlety. This is called zero loop. More broadly, X is a map from the world sheet, which can, you can think of as a Riemann surface, to target space, which in the simplest case will be our world. But here is just RD. So this was the zero loop case, and this was closed strings. We will always mean something different by the map at one loop. That one loop will mean that X will map from, for example, a torus a two torus into Rd. And then we'll use the same coordinate z to denote the coordinate on the point on the torus. And this will still map into x mu. It's called one loop because a torus, when sliced up, you can start with a closed string, meaning a little loop. And then it splits into two closed strings. And then they reform a closed string. If you draw this 
total surface that this sweeps out, it looks like a torus. So this is time and this is space. And this also confuses mathematicians that here I'm talking about Euclidean, but physicists tend to secretly keep in mind, and that's why we have this notation zero through nine, the zero is time. So really the notation mu is zero through nine refers to R one comma nine, so pseudo Riemannian space or Lorentzian signature as we say in physics. And this can also cause a lot of confusion for really no reason, because almost all our calculations we actually do in Euclidean space like this. There are not many times in these basic kind of discussions where we really need this uh, structure here. And now what about this closed string comment? So closed strings means that this loop. And if we wanted to do open strings, then you would replace the complex plane by, for example, a, the upper half plane. also known sometimes as the disk. And you will replace the torus by other surfaces with chi equals zero. Where I mean chi, I mean the topological oil characteristic, chi effective. And we'll talk more about this later. Concretely, what this means is that you can have the annulus surface. You can have a Mobis strip or you can have a Klein bottle. So if you take an annulus as an example, that means you can have an interval, an open string, that is not a closed loop like here, but it's an open string. And then it splits into two parts, or rather it splits into two open strings, and then they reform an open string. And if you draw this entire process as it's swept out, then it looks like a cylinder. And a cylinder is topologically an annulus. So the annulus, to me, the annulus and the cylinder is effectively the same thing. So this was a brief introduction. What is an open string? Well, open string is an interval in space. But when I say open strings, I mean that the map X that we're interested in maps, for example, from instead of from the torus to, to RD, it will map from, for example, the cylinder or the annulus to RD. And by this error, I don't mean map, I mean replace replaced by. So this is a different kind of string theory, but it's closely related to the thing above. So, so a two loop, the world sheet could now be a double torus. So the map will then be from the double torus into RD, for example, and we will still call this Z. And this is again why we have to be a little careful because I call it Z, I keep calling it Z, but it refers to different spaces. So this is one reason that String theory can be interesting to people who care about things that are not just a torus or a complex plane, but in general to Riemann surfaces like the double torus. And then, of course, it'd be significant that this has limits where this becomes two tori connected by a thin tube. This torus embedding will somehow sit as some kind of subcase of this two loop thing. So it's important both to know what is the baseline, it's the torus. And what is the advanced version, which might be more interesting, it could, it could be this. And then let me say something about the other parts. And I talked, how can we vary the world sheet? We can look at the complex plane. We can look at the upper half plane. We can look at the torus, at this double torus. What about this thing? Well, one generalization is we can replace this RD. For those of you who care about the real world in phenomenology, of course, if I set the equals 10, it's not going to be very useful for phenomenology. But of course, you may be interested in string theory for other reasons than straight up phenomenology. But if you replace this by RD times something compact, for example. So we take some smaller D, D smaller than capital D, and we make some part of this a compact space. But interesting examples, as far as I'm concerned, are, for example, put a four real dimensional Calabi-Yau space. So we will see what this means for us. This would have a very simple meaning. Many of you probably heard about Calabi-Yau's, but probably some of you have no idea really what they are. That's okay. Or we can do R4 times a Calabi-Yau threefold that has six real dimensions. So this is sort of the more natural case since we live in four dimensions. 
But this will be my favorite basic example for the purpose of this mini course. So here, we will often talk about this four-dimensional manifold K3. And in fact, I will view it not as a manifold, but I will represent it as an orbifold for most of my examples. Orbifold. An orbifold is not a manifold. It can have conical singularities. And this is not so hard to define. So now I'll define this. So define. And then we can see what is the Calabiao condition in this context. So make a complex variable z from the sixth and the seventh of these coordinates of the x map. Because recall that we had 10 of these if we had 10 dimensions. So I pick number six and seven simply because these are the first six. And then we have six, seven, eight, nine over here. So zero through five here, and then six, seven, eight, nine here. Now I make a complex combination where u is a complex structure modulus. And I define a similar one for the next part, x8 plus x9u. And the orbifold is defined as z1, for example. If I take this z goes to z plus 1, then I get a phase. So this is the bread and butter of this kind of calculation that we'll be talking about, that this z, which means originally this x, is not single valued under a translation by 1, which if you're on a torus, I picture a torus as a parallelogram with identified sides. And if you go from 0 to 1, then you get this phase. In other words, this x is not a single valued map. And this is another reason when I started, I wanted to talk about map. If you say function to mathematician, they tend to mean an actual function. But these are not single valued objects. These are multi-valued maps, which you know, is nothing terribly advanced. You know, logarithms are all multi-valued, but this is what we'll be working with. Now, the Calabiao condition will be that the second guy, meaning the second half of this space, this 8, 9 here, will transform oppositely. So these are the two behaviors of these z things. Calabia means that this one is minus the other one. So this is the Calabia condition as far as we're concerned now. More generally, the Calabia means Ricci tensor is 0 and is scalar. And it takes some work to see the connection between this and that. But trust me, there is a connection. And for now, all we have to know is this. So first of all, I didn't say very clearly, n is integer. When we go to this case, there are very tight restrictions on how these are arranged. And the condition that restricts it is that the action should be crystallographic in the combined sense when you have all three complex coordinates of these six three dimensions. But K3, there's really only one K3 manifold. The single K3 manifold can be represented at different orbital points. In my examples, I would mostly just consider two or three or maybe five. There's a single smooth manifold K3, then you get to one of these limits. So quasi-periodicity means it's pretty much periodic except for these phases. The idea is that this K over N thing, which I will later call little gamma for convenience, this thing will appear as the Z argument. This is, you won't mean anything until later of things like the Jacobi theta function, or more generally Jacobi forms, or the Eisenstein series E to R, where R is integer. By Eisenstein, I will actually mean a generalized form that's something that's called Kronecker Eisenstein. So the Kronecker Eisenstein Z argument, this thing will appear there. That's why this stuff is important to bring up right away. So this is not the only way you can get something interesting, certainly not, but it's, it's a way. What we will actually want to compute in this little mini course, to even state what I want to compute, I want to say just one 
worried about classical field theory. By that, I mean not quantum. So this I also find is a little bit challenging in discussing with mathematicians that not everybody is okay with just writing down an action. In physics, we just write down an action, like the Polyakov action. The Polyakov action is an action principle, which gives a variational principle for this world sheet. So this Z coordinate is, as I said, my world sheet. As I said, it could be complex plane, including infinity. It could be T2. It could be, as I said, cylinder, uh, one of these things. So I always call it a Z, but I will mostly keep, keep towards in mind if you don't know. And then conventionally, there's a constant here. So alpha prime is a constant. And then the derivative of this map X. And in coordinates, we have X mu. So now we have the bar derivative X mu. And then we can have plus some more terms that involve a fermion field but I won't write them at the moment. They will be important later. So here I just wrote psi terms. This is derivative with respect to Z. This is derivative with respect to Z bar. And this is a contraction using a flat metric in RD. So the point of writing this is that what's in parentheses here, this stuff is for me a Lagrange function or Lagrangian, which then gives by a var variational principle, meaning the older Lagrange equations, a equation for x. And here will be delta x, which is defined as lambda squared x is zero. So this action for x leads to this equation of motion, this uh, PDE. So this is the Laplace equation. This is a PDE. And in particular, it's homogeneous. So this is an exercise in remembering these words. What does homogeneous mean? What's a homogeneous PDE? What he just said was that there's a linear operator on a function x. And there could be some other function on the right-hand side. And of course, what right-hand side means, you know, depends on how you arrange it, but usually we arrange it like this, that the linear operator acts on F. Not, if this is there, then it's in homogeneous. So it's homogeneous if this vanishes, and it's in homogeneous if it's there. What's the Laplace equation called if there's a right-hand side? Well, then it's not called the Laplace equation. Now the squared x, which is the same as delta x to mathematicians, is some right-hand side. Yeah, just write generically some function g of x. Or here is z, sorry. I think most people have some idea how to solve an equation like this. And the solution that we'll be interested in is Polchinski, page 58. This is in volume one of Polchinski's book, if you want to take a look. It's just what you would expect. And you always run into notational problems. The Z I use is Polchinski's W divided by two pi. So W in Polchinski assumes that your torus, your worship torus, has the periodicity two pi and two pi tau. Whereas my Z variable has the periodicity one and tau. So there's a constant times some free sum from minus infinity to plus infinity, where we exclude zero. And there are some coefficients that I will call alpha m. And they will have the same index as this coordinate x mu. Conventionally, there's a one over m, and then there's the Fourier wave. So this is, this is a Fourier solution of the Laplace equation. And of course, these are just some bunch of infinite number of coefficients that then capture your solution. This was all classical field theory. And the main difference for our purposes in quantum field theory will be that you can either promote these coefficients to operators, or you consider functional integrals. And I think most physics students at this 
level are familiar with the idea that what it means to promote these coefficients to operators is that you just replace them by something that doesn't commute. So you say that now my alphas are suddenly non-commuting operators where this way of writing it, the order matters. It's not so important right now with the details, but excuse me, barely fit there. So it's just that it's something, it's not zero. This is just a generalization of Heisenberg algebra, x comma p is i h bar. So you, you generalize classical field theory to quantum field theory by allowing the coefficients in your expansions to be quantum operators. However, from my point of view, I would prefer mostly to think of functional integration, which means I introduce a statistical weighting by e to the minus s. And in physics, we tend to give Feynman a lot of credit for this, but this was done by mathematicians long before Feynman actually. So in statistics, it's well known that the variance or squared standard deviation doesn't have to be zero, even if the average is zero. So in general, the variance is not the product of two averages. And so this gives us a standard deviation. It gives us a correlation, a non-zero moment. And the weighting here is this S, which is my action functional I wrote up here. And it's a functional because X is a function. More generally, is a map. And this is a functional null of that maps because we're differentiating and integrating this map. So my supervisor was Cecile dewitt Moret, and I collaborated with her collaborator, Pierre Cartier, who's a mathematician. And they wrote a book together on this topic. This doesn't really tell you rigorous theory for how to do this. It just outlines how you maybe could do it in the future. So the normalization of a statistical quantity sounds kind of boring, but it will be very important to us. With the average of one, you might want that to be, well, one. The trick here is that for the sphere, this will be a constant number. So you can just divide by it and everything is normalized, everything's fine. But on the torus or similar one loop surfaces, the average of one depends on this complex structure tau, which parameterizes my torus. I'm assuming most physics students at this stage are reasonably familiar with quantum field theory, at least the basic ideas. You may not be familiar with this way of talking about that. To me, the main difference between quantum field theory and classical field theory is that we're not solving the homogeneous PD, but we're solving the inhomogeneous PD. And to me, that will mean, and we can write, maybe turn it on the side. So we're going to write here Green's function, just write it in the margin, Green's function method. The Green's function method is a general method to solve classical partial differential equations. If you have a solution of the homogeneous equation, you can now try to solve the inhomogeneous equation by the Green's function method. And this will be the key way that we will compute string amplitudes. So what I'd like to do, you to do now, first I'd like to take a, a good break and get a cup of coffee. And then I would like you to watch video nine is about string loop amplitudes. And this is in the spirit of the analogy I gave you with the mountain. I will try to pull you past all these discussions in videos zero through eight, because this is a mini course. We just go straight to the, to the fun stuff. And this is the course page. I hope you all have seen it. And I put the video nine here. I also gave you a Mathematica file for, for today. You can take a quick look if you want.